1967 American crime film Point Blank, directed by John Borman and starring Lee Marvin, along with Angie Dickinson, Keenan Wynn, and Carol O'Connor, is definitely a must-see if you love Lee Marvin's work. This is some of the most intense work that I've ever seen him do. And it's not like most of the roles that you see him in. This is a real thinker. After watching this show two or three times, I'm still not sure about the real story behind it. It really makes you think. It's based on the book called The Hunter by Donald Westlake. Lee Marvin was real instrumental in the development of the film and the rewriting of the script. He worked very closely with the director Borman. And it's pretty obvious they put together what, in my opinion, is an excellent film. It wasn't a box office smash, but it's gone on to be a cult classic. Some of the finest directors in Hollywood have looked back on this film and used it to develop their directorial style. Lee Marvin plays the main character called Walker, and we don't really know his first name. He never gives it. There's some dialogue between him and Angie Dickinson about this in the film. After taking part in the robbery of a large shipment of cash that was being transferred by helicopter to the deserted Alcatraz prison, Walker is shot and left for dead by his partner Mal Reese, played by John Vernon. He then runs off with Walker's wife, Lynn. Two years later on, while on a guided tour of the island, Walker is stopped by a stranger named Yost. He offers to help him uncover his share of the money by leading him to both Lynn and the criminal organization that Reese now belongs to. Shortly after, Lynn has killed herself in despair, and Walker ends up taking up with her sister Chris, who helps him finagle his way into Reese's heavily guarded penthouse. As Walker gets in a confrontation with Reese, Reese is thrown from the terrace to his death. But Walker is still determined to get his money, and he continues to hunt down other members of the organization in L.A. After two of this group, Carter and a car dealer named Stegman, die in a trap that was intended for him. Walker then makes his way to second-in-command Brewster. Greedy to take over the number one spot in the organization, Brewster proposes that Walker end up outwitting the top man in the organization called Fairfax by pulling a hijack job similar to the previous one that they pulled at Alcatraz. They make their way to Fort Point, San Francisco, where the cash transfer is to take place. As Brewster bends over to pick up the pack of money, a shot rings out, and he falls dead. Then we find out that Yost, who is actually Fairfax, appears to acknowledge Walker's unwitting assistance in eliminating those organization men who were a threat to his power. He offers Walker a job, and Fairfax points to the packet of money and tells him to come and take it. Walker is there standing in the darkness, and he considers the proposition for a moment, and then he disappears into the shadows of the building. Erwin Winkler produced this film, and he had just come off producing Double Trouble for MGM. He was really enthusiastic about the script, and he felt that Lee Marvin was the perfect person to play Walker. Problem was, he had a heck of a time getting the script to Lee Marvin, so he ended up sending it to John Borman, who was an up-and-coming director at the time that he knew from his early years in Hollywood. Lee Marvin was in London shooting The Dirty Dozen, and Borman met with him. They talked about the script. They talked about the book. They both absolutely hated the script, but they loved the idea of the Walker character. Marvin said he would work on the film as long as they were allowed to discard this script. And Marvin said he wanted script approval, and he wanted principal cast approval as well. Once he was given this by the studio, he turned and looked to the studio heads and said, I defer all my approvals to John Borman, the director. He turned around and walked out of the office, and Borman, on basically his first big Hollywood film, ends up getting final cut and cast selection, and he made use of it. What a deal for this up-and-coming director. MGM decided to fund the thing with $2 million, but the head of production wanted the female lead to be Stella Stevens. 
but the director, Borman, insisted on Angie Dickinson. This film has a really unusual structure to it, something you normally didn't see at that time in Hollywood. And it's kind of based on the non-linear structure of the novel. Rehearsals for the film took place at Lee Marvin's house in L.A., where he was most comfortable and he could really shine in developing this film. He was amazing at working with other actors and trying to get them to fit into the film as well as he did. A lot of times he would hold his tongue and let silence be the guide. It would make the other actors have to continue their dialogue and be more forceful with their conversation. This turned conventional scenes into something much more. Alcatraz had been shut down in 1963, and this was the first film that was shot there. The two weeks that they spent shooting there required 125 crew members to make it happen. One of the big concerns that they had was how well they could record dialogue in this setting. They thought that they might have to loop the scenes. They were extremely concerned about the weather out there and how it would affect production. During this shoot, Angie Dickinson and Sharon Acker modeled contemporary fashions for Life magazine. And they did this with the backdrop of the prison. There were a few injuries in the filming. Acker was accidentally hurt by the blanks that were used to shoot Lee Marvin early in the film. Not anything serious, but enough to give her some powder burn. The house that they use where Walker meets Brewster is actually a house in the Hollywood Hills that was rented as a filming location. As of the late 2015s, this property is still standing and is owned by Drew Barrymore. She purchased the home in April of 2002 for $4.3 million. The home was originally built in 1957 and is over 7.7 thousand square feet, and it sits on 1.25 acres. The scene where Walker surprises Lynn and he shoots up the bed and then he gets information from her was written to have him interrogate her. But when they shot it, Lee Marvin chose to stay silent. He had a way of influencing scenes without you knowing it. He wasn't known to make suggestions. He would do things that would just show you what needed to be done. That's the brilliance of the way he did this scene. Now, there's kind of an interesting story about James Seeking and how he auditioned for the role of the assassin. After he did his audition, Borman told him that he couldn't use him for the film, that his face was really too nice looking to be a killer. For the entire next week, though, Borman would look out his office window, which was at MGM Studios, and he would see James standing outside, partially concealed by a bush or a column, just kind of peeping out, watching him in a menacing manner. The director eventually got up, walked out, and offered him the part. He was convinced that he could play a good assassin. While they were on the set and shooting the scene where Angie Dickinson, where you can see her nude profile in the background, she was asked whether or not she dresses to impress men or women. Her response was, I dress for women, I undress for men. Now Lee Marvin did not like the character that John Vernon played. He felt that he wasn't a strong enough character to contend with his character. This all came to a head at one time during the filming, when during a scuffle, Marvin punched him in the stomach during a fight scene. This caused Vernon to sit down and bust into tears and protest to the director and Marvin that he was an actor and not a fighter. But this worked to kick his butt into gear. He visibly increases his energy and anger after this scene happened. Steven Soderbergh talks about the sound of Walker's footsteps as he walks quickly through the airport. This is a monumental part of the beginning of the film. After Lee Marvin died, Borman was talking to his widow, and she asked the filmmaker if he wanted anything that Lee had to remember him by. The thing he asked for were the shoes that were used in that scene. This movie is as suspenseful as thrillers go. Although it was ignored in 1967, it is now regarded as a top film to see. Take a look at this amazing picture. You'll be sorry that you haven't seen it sooner. 
Thank you so much for watching, and we'll continue to chase the classics.